In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Would, it, would a little snow stop people from going to the Super Bowl? Or a hockey match? Or baseball? Basketball? Well, we don't snow in baseball time, but... I'm glad we're living for God today. Aren't you? I'm glad He brought me out of darkness into this marvelous light. Gave me an ab abundant hope. Hallelujah. And the Bible even says we will have an abundant entrance to the everlasting kingdom of our God. Hallelujah. Praise God. i got to get a little warmed up. I'm not physically cold, but I need to. You know, I'm glad some things have changed in Pentecost. Now, it sounds weird coming from me. But, we used to sing some really cornball songs. They used to sing a song, Lord, build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. Hey man, I ain't living for God for a cabin in the corner. Are you? No, 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 no. And they used to sing a song that said, I'll be so glad if I can only make it in. My theme song in the Bible is sweeping through the gates. Hallelujah. Not crawling through, dragging through, falling through. I'm going to be sweeping through the gates by the blood of Calvary's Lamb, washed from every sin I am. Hallelujah. I'm sweeping through the gates. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. It's a matter of outlook. It's a matter of an outlook, and we have an abundant hope this morning, and uh, I'm glad about it today. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Would you open your Bibles today to the book of Second Corinthians? I hope that there will be some more people joining us uh, here in a few minutes. I know they usually do. But uh, anyway... I want to read one verse in 2 Corinthians 5. Well, let's read two. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11. Give you a chance to find that. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, 5, 10 and 11, excuse me. It reads like this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, to those that are in the church here this morning... I don't know if you know the distinction or not. Uh, there is a great white throne judgment. And the great white throne judgment is at the end of the millennium, and it is for the wicked dead. And every man's going to be judged out of the book, the book of life, and the book. There's two books. The book it says the books were open. One is the book of life. And the other one is the the book. That's what the Bible means. The role, the book. And those dead are going to be judged out of the things written in the book. And if any man's name was not found written in that book, he was cast alive into the lake of fire. There's nobody going to heaven at that judgment. The judgment that he's talking about here in 2 Corinthians 5.10 is the judgment seat of Christ. In technical terms, it's called the Bema Judgment. And this is for saved people. Now that's... But you need to keep this in mind. I need to keep it in mind. I, I keep it in mind. I want to remind us about it. Bema Judgment. At the Bema Judgment, it's not a judgment whether people are saved or lost. Because if you make it to the Bema Judgment, you're already saved. But our life that we live since we were born again will be judged. 
And every man's works will be judged. It says here, we must all... Now, this is written to the church, so it's talking about the beam of judgment. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to the he hath done, whether it is good or bad. And it goes on in another place to say that our works will be judged by fire. Said it'll try every man's works. That that works goes from the day you got baptized in Jesus' name and received the Holy Ghost till you die or the rapture takes place. Whatever we did in that time span will be judged. Now, realistically, we would like to think that everything we do is good, but we know there's some things we foul up. That's why we have the mercy of God. And, and listen to, I don't even, this is not even my message, message this morning, but I just want, well, it is my message, but it's not my notes. Um, lost my thought. Anyway, we're going to be judged whether they be good or bad. And it said, if any man's works are burned up, he's going to suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, so as by fire. So our reward in glory depends on what happens at the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. And, you know, the Bible talks about if any man build on this foundation wood, hay, stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. What are we building on this morning? Wood, hay, and stubble are going to be burned up. Gold and silver and precious stones are going to pass the fire test. Amen, amen. I want to build... He didn't tell me I should wear gold, silver, and precious stones, but I should live gold, silver, and precious stones. In fact, you want to know what God thinks about it? Just read about the tabernacle in the wilderness. The tabernacle in the wilderness had badger skins, ram skins, and goat skins. The covering of the tent. On the inside were gold and silver and white linen. What's supposed to be on the inside of our life? Gold, silver, white linen, hallelujah. Those are things that... So, But anyway, let's get off of that. Now, and so, that's not my text. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether good is good or bad. So, that little verse just tells us we want to make sure we're working on good things. Amen? Amen? And you know, why do we have trials in our life? So, well, the devil's beat me up. No, he's not. Why do we have tests and trials in our life? You know how you refine gold? You put it through the heat. And everything that's dross or junk comes to the top and you skim it off. So what's God doing in our life? He allows trials and tests. Fiery trials, the Bible says. Think it not strange. Fiery trials. Why? The Lord's wanting to skim off the dross out of our life so that we'll come out with pure gold in our spirit. Hallelujah. So that He can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Isn't that... That's a good prospect, isn't it? No. Text, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest to your conscience. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You can be seated. Let's pray for a little together today. Lord, would you help us today? Would you anoint your servant as well as your word? Would you give us liberty in the spirit, O oh God, and write words this morning that your purpose can be accomplished in this service today, Lord? We give you praise in Jesus' name. I'm on a mission this morning. I'm not saying this to toot my horn because that's not the way I am. But from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock this morning, the Lord woke me up at that time and 
I looked at the clock and thought it was getting up time, but it wasn't. But I began to pray and seek the Lord. And He began to move this message in my heart today. I'm on a mission this morning. You know, the Lord told Ezekiel, and he tell, in that message he tells every preacher, that he made us a watchman on the wall. But there's such a tremendous responsibility with being a watchman. I don't want just any old Tom, Dick, and Harry being a watchman over my soul. Um, there was a man one time that was, he was upset at his pastor because his pastor was preaching it right down the line and it was, he was getting aggravated and he was getting mad about it. And, and so he went to the pastor and he said, I think I'm going to change churches. I'm going to go over here to this other brother's church. And he said, why are you going to do that? He said, well, he'll let me do this and he'll let me do that and you won't let me do this and you won't let me do that. Uh, I'm changing churches. So the pastor said, well, that's what you've got to do, you know. And then the guy came back to him and he said, you know, I got to thinking. That guy just might let me be lost. So I'm sticking with you, preacher. Whatever you got to do, do it. But don't let me be lost. Amen. Amen. And so the watchman on the wall, the Lord said to the watchman, He said, I've made you a watchman on the wall. And if you see the enemy coming, and you don't warn the people, and they die in their iniquity, their blood's going to be on your hands. But if you see the enemy coming and you sound the warning and they don't hear you and they perish in their iniquity, their blood will be on their head. And so every time a man of God, a real man of God, stands behind this pulpit, he's not playing games. He's not interested in entertaining you. He's not interested in any of that. He's got his soul on the line. Amen? And so I'm on a mission this morning. I don't know how many in the church here have that come to church here regularly have the Holy Ghost, and how many don't. I, I, I just somehow or another I can't. I don't make all those acquaintances I need to make. But I do know that there are people that come that are not ready. Now, according to the Bible, people that have not yet received the Holy Ghost are lost. Now, we don't like to talk in terms like that. I don't like that. And neither does God. He's not willing that any perish, but that all would come to repentance. Second Peter 3, 9. And so it is the will of God for everyone. You say, why didn't say everyone received the Holy Ghost? Well, can't receive the Holy Ghost without repenting. And so he's not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. And so... The goodness, the Bible says, Romans says, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Did you know I came to church many years of my life and I didn't know I was lost? I thought my mom brought me to church from the time I was three years old. I just thought I saved because I came to church. I knew all the songs. I, back then I did. I knew all the songs. Uh, I thought I was going to go to heaven because my mom was going to go to heaven. And I had a lot of relatives in the church that, you know, but this will sound silly. Just laugh if you want to. It won't offend me because it's the truth. I didn't realize I was lost until July the 6th, 1964, on a Tuesday night. I heard Brother Doyle Spears preach a vision of hell. And as he began to preach that message, it dawned on that teenage kid, that's where I'm headed. I'm lost. It scared the bejeebers out of me, whatever that is. I couldn't sleep all night because... I, in my tent, I was praying, Brother Benz Wallace. The other kids were sleeping. I couldn't sleep. 
I prayed all night long, Oh, Lord Jesus, please don't let me die or please don't come tonight because I'm going to hell. That's where I'm going. You would have think somebody would have been offended if, if somebody told you, you're going to hell. You'd get mad and offended. It didn't offend me. I'm telling you, the, the awfulest dread came on my soul. I, I remember I remember crying in the night, Oh God, don't let me die! But the next opportunity, Wednesday night, I could hardly wait for the preacher to shut up because I wanted to get to that altar. I wanted him to just just get get out of the way. Let me get to that altar. I didn't know I could get up and go any time I wanted to, but I just said, "Hurry up, hurry up, get say it, get it done with, give me a chance." And right in the center aisle, I couldn't even get to the altar. That place was so packed. I remember falling on the floor, tears and mud running down my face. Crying, oh God, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be lost. And in a few moments' time, the Lord heard me and I had the Holy Ghost and my whole life changed. I'm so glad that Brother Doyle Spears wasn't worried about offending anybody. I'm so glad that he, he well, I know he cared, but I'm, he was not worried about offending anybody because he had an understanding of the terror of the Lord. He understood what it really meant to be lost and the only way to be saved. And so this morning I'm preaching a message called Red Lights and Sirens. Red Lights and Sirens. Do you know what Red Lights and Sirens mean? Well, they got red and blue now, but why do they have flashing lights? Why do they have sirens? First you get the flashing lights. That's to get your attention. What are you supposed to do when you see flashing lights? Push down on the accelerator. Not if you got a brain. And it's working. The law says when we see red lights, or red and blue lights flashing, what are we supposed to do? Pull over and stop. Sirenes begin to go on. If we pass that one up, the siren comes on. It means there's an emergency. It means there's an urgency. It may be, if it's an ambulance, it's rushing to the scene of an accident and people's lives are in danger. And they don't want you puttering along 50 miles an hour in in the fast lane. They want you to pull over and stop. Get out of the way. That emergency vehicle's coming through. It speaks of urgency and fervency. If there's something going on, there's something got to be taken care of. There's people dying. There's people uh, in danger. There's people that are injured. Get out of the way. So pull over and stop. And today, while Brother Fraser was preaching the other other morning, I believe it was last Sunday morning, the Lord dropped that thought into my mind. I said, why are you talking to me about that, Lord? I'm not going to get no ticket. But then all of a sudden this morning, it began to dawn on me. We need to understand that it is an urgency. It's an emergency. There's fervency involved. we got to get with the program. And that is if we're without the Holy Ghost. We've got to get the Holy Ghost. Not today. Not next week. Not next month. Right now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. It is the appointed time to draw near to God and get right with God. And so, I mentioned to you that without the Holy Ghost, we cannot go to heaven. And I'm not just spouting that off. Romans 8 and 9 says, without the Spirit of Christ, we are none of His. The Spirit of Christ and the Holy Ghost are not different things. There's only one Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit because God is holy and He's a Spirit. It's also called the Spirit of Christ. That's the same thing. There's one body and one Spirit. And then he goes on to say, If the Spirit of Him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, it shall quicken your mortal bodies. That means that's what's going to cause you to go in the rapture, is that the Holy Ghost is in your life. It will resurrect you from the dead. It will translate you from earth to heaven, uh, to glory. Amen! And so it is important we see red lights flashing and hear sirens. It tells us there's an emergency. We're supposed to pull over and stop, knowing the terror of the Lord. What do we know about the terror of the Lord? 
The book of Jonah shows us the terror of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Jonah. It's a minor prophet. He spoke to Jonah and he says, Jonah, go preach to Nineveh. Now, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. In fact, he was kind of reading from, you read the whole book, you get the kind of idea he hoped Nineveh would be destroyed. As far as I can tell, he's the only, the only preacher that ever had a revival that didn't want one. He didn't want to preach to Nineveh. They were sinners. They were wicked, violent people. He, it would have pleased him just fine if they were lost. And the Lord says, you go preach to Nineveh. And he went the opposite way. He went to Tarshish on a ship towards Tarshish. And the Lord showed Jonah what the terror of the Lord was. He was thrown overboard. And it said the Lord prepared a great fish. And it swallowed Jonah. Now the Bible, Jonah said, I went into the belly of hell. He was in that fish's belly for three days and three nights. Jonah actually died in that whale. Not a whale, that large fish. When it said, out of the belly of hell, the word right there really means the grave. You can look it up. That's what it means. It's Sheol, hell, the grave. But before he gasped his last breath, he said, I cried unto the Lord. And he heard me. And the f- fish barfed Jonah up on the beach. And the location where he barfed him up on the beach was three days' journey from Nineveh. But when you read your Bible, you find out that Jonah got an understanding of the terror of the Lord. He saw red lights and heard sirens. This was emergency. This wasn't playing games. This wasn't messing around. There was some there was some fervency. There was a fire put in Jonah's guts. And the Bible says he made that three days journey and a one day journey. He wasn't fooling around. He was picking them up and putting them down. There was a pitchfork in his rear end. God was saying, you get to Nineveh. The Bible tells us that city was 120,000 people. That didn't know their right hand from their left hand. It wasn't they were retards. They just didn't know a thing about God. They didn't understand the terror of the Lord. They didn't know where they were headed. They were headed to a hell that was going to be hot and eternal. And the only thing standing between them was a man by the name of Jonah that had a message from God. And his message from God was, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. It's going to be wiped out. The judgment of God is coming on this city. Now, Jonah had a wrong attitude. He preached the Lord out of contention. He didn't have any love for those Ninevites. He really wanted them to perish. But God was gouging him. There's 120,000 souls that have never heard. They don't know what to do. And Jonah came preaching into that city. He blew into town. He wasted no time. The red lights were flashing. The siren was blaring. And it said 40 days. And Nineveh's going to be destroyed. It's going to be wiped out. Judgment from God is coming. Now the Ninamites were notorious for their cruelty and their wickedness. History tells us that on either side of the gates of Nineveh, there were piles of human skulls. People that they had beheaded and tortured and tormented. They wanted anybody that saw the, the city of Nineveh to be afraid of them. But when Jonah hit town, he didn't see no 
piles of skulls. He heard the voice of the Lord. Forty days in this place is going to be destroyed. You would think that that would make a lot of people mad. We know when we witness to some people, they get mad. Who are you to tell me? You know. But when you hear red lights and sirens, you just tell it anyway. Now what happened? Jesus testified of the effectiveness of Jonah's message. He said the citizens of Nineveh are going to rise up in judgment against you, Capernaum. I think the town was Capernaum. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And Jesus said, a greater than Jonah is here. The God of glory was there. What happened in Nineveh? Did they send out the troops? Did they capture him? Did they beat him up? Did they torture him? No. The message came to the king's ears. There's a wild-eyed preacher down here saying 40 days and we're going to be destroyed. What are we going to do? And the king said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take, he took off his royal robe. And just to illustrate it, he got a potato sack, cut the ears off and cut a hole in the middle. Pulled it down over his head and reached over to the fireplace and got a pile of ashes and spread them on the floor and sat down in it. He said to every man, woman, boy, and girl, donkey, cat, rat, mouse, nobody's going to eat anything. Nobody's going to drink anything. Perhaps the God of heaven will hear our prayer and change his mind. He commanded everybody. To put on sack. You ever had burlap on you? How would you like to have some burlap underwear? You wouldn't like that. But they were, Jonah was so fervent and so passionate. The red lights were flashing by the fisher. The siren was screaming. They gladly got in sackcloth and ashes. And the Bible said they repented. They turned from their iniquity. And the Lord spoke to that preacher. And He said, you know what, Mr. Jonah? I'm sparing Nineveh because I saw their good works. What were the good works? They got down to dealing with their cruelty, their sin, their cussing, their lying, their cheating, their fornicating, their adultery, murder, whatever they were doing that was wrong. They said they began to confess it to God and ask Him to forgive them. And the God of glory said, Jonah, I have seen their good works and I've changed my mind. If you want to change God's mind, you won't change His nature, but you can change His mind. Because He's angry with the wicked every day. He, he said, the wicked shall be cast into hell in every nation that forgets God. But you can change God's mind if you fall on your face. And begin to cry out, say, God, have mercy on me. I've been sinning. I'm guilty. I'm lost. And I need you. And you say, well, what do you preach? It's my job this morning to turn on the red lights. It's my job to turn on the siren. It's my job to walk up and down the aisles and say, judgment is coming. The Bible says He's appointed a day that He's going to judge every man's works by Jesus Christ. It's not going to be what your grandma thought you were. To your grandma, you're the sweetest little kid and the sweetest little girl that ever walked the earth. You're the best looking. You may be as ugly as a mud fence. But to your mama and your grandmother, you're the beautiful. But grandma's not the judge. Jesus is the judge. You need to be more concerned about what Jesus says than what your husband or wife or your girlfriend or boyfriend says. There were some people that got convicted while Jesus preached, but they didn't repent because they loved the praise of men more than they loved the praise of God. They were more worried about what somebody else thought. 
Listen, I can tell you that you're the best thing since sliced bread, sliced bread, but that don't make it so. God knows the heart. God knows the heart. Now, how urgent was Jonah? If I read that scripture right, the city couldn't have been a three, took three days to travel across. It had 120,000 population. You can walk across a town that big in one day, a little bit of time. The urgency that Jonah made that three-day trip in one day. Because God was pushing him. The terror of the Lord. And he was effective in persuading those men and women of Nineveh. Not just one or two. All of them came to repentance. To persuade today means to convince by presenting the facts. Not feelings, facts. Now, if I, if I couldn't be a preacher, I'd want to be a lawyer. A prosecuting attorney. That's how I'm wired. How does, what does the prosecuting attorney do? They endeavor to convict by the preponderance of evidence. They put fact on top of fact on top of fact on top of fact. Until they say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are obligated to bring forth the verdict of guilty because of the preponderance of of evidence. And he goes over it again. So when you deliberate, you must bring back a verdict of guilty. Because I presented to you the preponderance of evidence. The preponderance of evidence is for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You may be a good person, you may not you know, but when we were born, we were born into sin. We were born with a lost nature. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, behold, I was born in the shape and born in iniquity. Or I can't even think of it. Conceived in sin and shaped in iniquity. And David cried out, O oh Lord, deliver me from blood guilt. And the Lord heard him and said, I put away your sin. And he made him a model citizen because David was a man after God's own heart. Not because he was perfect, but because he knew how to repent. He knew how to face up to the music and realize that he needed God. And God heard him. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It goes on to say there's none righteous, no, not one. There was only one person born into this world without sin, and that was Jesus Christ. And he was born by supernatural birth. Amen. Now, sometimes we think that because we're not as wicked as somebody down the street, that we're okay. Jesus said it like this in Luke 13. He said, Suppose you that the Galileans were sinners. But he said, You know, Herod, they mixed, Herod mingled their blood with their own sacrifices. Do you think they were sinners above all the Galileans because that happened to them? I'm paraphrasing. You can read it. People were saying, boy, they must have been wicked people because God let that happen to them when they were offering sacrifices to the Lord. Herod came along and killed some of them, mixed their blood with the sacrifice. They must have been really bad off. He says, you think they were sinners above all those other people? They were more wicked? Jesus said, No. He said, except you repent, you'll perish. And what about that 18 people the Tower of Siloam fell on? 
guilt. Do you think that happened to them because they were really, really bad sinners? Jesus said, I tell you, no. Except you repent. You'll all likewise perish. We're talking about the evidence this morning. In fact, one time, all has sinned. Come short of the glory of God. I could go on, but I don't have that much time. Now, Jonah's message was 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And they repented because he preached that message. Jesus came by in John 3, 5. He looked at a religious man. He was up in the hierarchy of the Jewish religion. He was a member of the Sanhedrin council. He came to Jesus by night uh, and he said, uh, We know you're a teacher come from God because nobody can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. And Jesus just bypassed all of that palaver and he said, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. He said, except the man be born again of water and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He just threw all that other stuff aside and he got right down to the brass tacks. Just like Jonah. Forty days, Nineveh's going to be overthrown, destroyed. The red lights were flashing. The sirens were screaming. And Jesus looked at Nicodemus and he said, oh boy, you're up there in the high altitude of religion. But if you aren't born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. You can't hear it or see it. It's no wonder as you read your Bible further, you will find out that Nicodemus was born again. What got him off of that religious hierarchyism when Jesus said, if you don't make a change in your life, if you don't repent of your sins and get baptized in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of sins and receive the Holy Ghost, you don't have a snowball's chance. Nicodemus was born again. He was born again. The writer of Hebrews said, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken of the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him. God bearing them witness with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. My friend tonight, I, today, I don't know your name. I've seen your faces, but I can't remember your names. But I'm going to tell you something. It's about time that we got right down to brass tacks. The red light is flashing this morning. i got the siren on. If you ever thought about living for God, you need to hit this altar right now now and begin to cry out to God and say, Lord, I need the Holy Ghost. I need the transformation in my life. I want to turn from sin. Did you know the Lord will give you the Holy Ghost? Just like that. I remember one Sunday night in Ventura, there was a lady, she was up in her 70s. Somehow... Somebody in the church met her, and and uh, I went to visit her. She had visited church, and I went to her apartment, talked to her, and uh, she was a country woman from Tennessee. Uh, she was old, she was, you know, old seventy, you know, but she was in her seventies, and she was old. She could hardly get around, and she had never been to church in her life. So I invited her. Her name was Dorothy. I said, Dorothy, you need to come to church and get right. Oh, I love. No, I said, no. You need to come and get right. And I had a lady in my church. I asked her to teach her a home Bible study. And she taught her a search for truth home Bible study. And that Sunday night, she was in church. She was sitting in this because our building was fan shaped. And she was sitting on the second row in the center section. And I was doing my best to reach people. There were people there that were lost. There were people that didn't know they were lost. And there were people that didn't care if they were lost. And I was bearing down on it kind of like this morning. And all of a sudden, that old lady, she stood up in the middle of my message. And she said, Pastor, when can I get the Holy Ghost? And I just said, you can get the Holy Ghost right now. And I...
to go to hell? Are, ready, are you ready to go to that place where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not? Where the smoke of their torment ascendeth forever and ever? Are you ready to go to that place where your na- all you hear is weeping and gnashing of teeth? You hear people cursing and God and screaming and yelling. The rich man in hell said, I'm tormented in these flames. You may be wondering where you're going to get your next hit or your next drink. That man was worried about one drop of water. That's all he wanted. He didn't want a gallon. He wanted a drop of water. He said, how urgent is this? Can you believe Jesus? Would you open your Bible this morning to the Gospel of Mark? I want to tell you how urgent Jesus felt it was. Mark the ninth chapter. And verse, starting with verse 43, Jesus brought the mail to the mailbox. And He said it like this. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to to hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. You think, well, I'd like to be saved, but my hands just do the wrong kind of things. You say, oh, Jesus was just speaking metaphorically. He really didn't mean, oh, yes, he did. He meant if you, you can't keep your hands from doing things they ought not to do, it would be better if you just cut that hand off so that you couldn't do the sinful deeds anymore. It would be better that you went through life uh, uh, with maimed with only one hand and go to heaven rather than go to hell having two hands to go to hell where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. He didn't stop there. He said if your right eye offends you, If you can't stop looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at. If you could, if you can't keep yourself out of the theater. If you can't keep yourself from doing things, seeing things that are not right. It may please your flesh. You may like to look at Playboy and Hustler. But if your eye is offending you, and it's, he said you better pluck it out. It's better to go through life having only one eye than go to hell where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Oh, he said, if your foot offends you, if you can't stop yourself from going to the wrong places, Jesus said, those places will lead you to hell. Then you better get out a pocket knife and cut off your foot. It's better to go through life walking on a cane and with one leg and then to go to hell with two legs. What's Jesus doing? Red lights. Siren. This morning, we're not fooling around here. New Life Apostolic Church, you might like to come for the shouting and the dancing and the music moves you. I'm glad it does. But I'm telling you, that you need to let the Word of God move you out of that seat and grab a hold of yourself and say, buddy, I don't want to be lost. I- I've got to have the Holy Ghost right now. Let's stand, brothers and sisters. That's the reason this church exists. It exists to reach out to people that are lost. It exists for the purpose of helping people pray through. It exists for helping people to draw near to God. Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful
Books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 